welcome to the coming soon to a region near you, a community archiving workshops around the U.S. A quick announcement. Um, I hope you all can stay on Saturday for the Community AV Archiving Fair that we're having in the pavilion. Uh, we have flyers in the back, so take one and remember that where the pavilion is. <laughs> so, um, so this panel is put together just to give you an idea of how the Community Archiving Workshop is growing and expanding in the last couple of years. Um, so it's, it's basically divided up into four parts. Uh, I will give you a brief introduction of what we call CA. If you've heard it around about, and maybe uh, called some people some CA people, that would be us. Um, so I'll give you the history, the vision, and the different projects that we've been working on. Amy Sloper and Jen Hart will be talking about how um, CA uh, went to ATOM this year. The Association of Tribal Archives, Libraries, and Museums meeting uh, in Minnesota. Uh, Kelly Hicks will be talking about the two calls that she organized in Nashville uh, back in 2015 and 2018. Uh, and Mariah Ulinskis will be talking about um, the big project that we started this year, an IMLS funded training of trainers, what we call the CAW TOTS. <laughs> so, we've added TOTS. <laughs> um, so first up, previously on CAW, um, first off, who in here has participated in a CAW? Who has heard about COP? Who wants to participate in a COP? Who wants it in your region? <laughs> You're in the right place. Uh, CA is a volunteer organized, in a nutshell, pre, it started out as a pre-conference workshop at EMEA, and we're moving way beyond that now. It gives EMEA attendees a chance to meet locals and learn about local collections and organizations. It helps organi local organizations gain better intellectual and physical control over their collections and allowing them to prioritize different materials for preservation. Uh, CA also builds awareness and interest within community about local collections and audiovisual archiving and also, it is super fun, as you'll see with all these pictures. The workshop was first organized by Mona Jimenez uh, of uh, NYU Miyak fame. Uh, in 2010, she organized what was known then as Activist Archiving Workshop outside of the official Mia conference in Philadelphia. She worked with the Scribe Video Center and in 2011, 2012, the Independent Media Committee and the Diversity Committee joined first forces to organize and sponsor cause to be part of the EMEA conference. And we've been um, growing and continuing ever since. So, cause started with the focus of video collections. In 2011, we branched out to film at the Austin Histor History Center. And now we're um, doing pretty much video, film, or digital collections nearly every year. And this year, we're excited to have a featured collection at KBU, which is exclusively audio tapes, and I believe open reel audio tapes. So they'll have 200 open reel audio tapes in the pavilion tomorrow, all day, we'll be going through them. And we also have audio digitization going 
So we'll be digitizing KBU stuff, we'll be inventorying KBU stuff, and hopefully KBU will have that um, for the rest of their existence. So CA is truly a group, group effort. Um, we are all over the place, as you can see by the map, um, in and outside the country. Uh, we're all in about four different time zones at the moment. <laughs> And, um, and we, we have a range of experience. A lot of us are in traditional lives. Some of us are independent consultants. Others work in media centers on digital projects. It's really a nice array of help. And truly, I mean, we wouldn't still be in call probably if we didn't have the support system and uh, that we get it done. And it just doesn't seem that hard. <laughs> uh, past archiving workshops. Uh, this is a map of some of the past workshops. And I've listed the ones that are associated with MIA that we've had since 2011. Um, in that capacity, we have done seven cause in seven cities within the US. We have worked with collections from 12 different community organizations and artists. And led by co-founder Mona Jimenez, there have also been other workshops in New York City, Oaxaca, and Manila. Among others, she's done many. Uh, last year, we did a new uh, collaboration with EMEA DLF Hack Day uh, and Novak in New Orleans. Uh, we did the first community AV archiving uh, fair, AV, AV fair for short, and it's based on several stations and we invite the community to come with AV materials and questions. They can get hands-on experience too. And we have other call projects that you might not know about. Uh, we have the film kit. Uh, it lives in the EMEA offices and you can request it and they will ship it to you and you will ship it back and you can have <laughs> rewinds, leader, everything in, and Amy Sloper put it together right before Pittsburgh 2016 and it is a great resource and if any of y'all are going to do film and don't have the equipment, um, call it the Mia and rent out the Film kit. Hey, it's pictured there. We're just looking at it. <laughs> uh, we also have the Community Archive Collective. It is a working group of CAW members that provide consultation, training, assessment, services for audiovisual collections. And earlier this year, we received IMLS funding for Community Archiving Workshop, a regional training of trainers, which you'll hear about later. And finally, we have our online handbook, AKA website, um, which we've started to put all of our documentation in, and we also have a lot of pictures uh, of all the cause that we've done, especially those associated at the EMEA conference. And I don't know if anybody else has gotten that notification from Flickr about limiting your free access to pictures. It really scared me because we use Flickr, our general account, and you're limited to 1,000 pictures. So far, we just have like 350, so we're good to go. <laughs> and that's it for me. Next up is Amy, and she'll talk about call at ATOM. Jen is going to come up and join me after I give a little bit of an introduction to the call workshop we did at ATOM. Um, so if you were at the plenary this morning, you might have heard a little bit about this. Jen and Michael talked about it. I'm going to go into a little more detail. 
Um, so for those of you who don't know, ATOM is an international nonprofit organization that maintains a network of support for indigenous programs, provides culturally relevant programming and services, encourages collaboration among tribal and non-tribal institutions, and articulates contemporary issues related to developing and sustaining the cultural uh, sovereignty of Native nations. So they've been around, this was the 11th conference. Um, they're doing a lot for the community. Um, and there's, there were, there's a lot of um, people not working on tribal collections going now, so there's, it's building a much larger community. Um, so the theme of this year's conference, which was in October in Prior Lake, Minnesota at the Mississippi Casino, was inspired by Sid Bean and his twin daughters, Kate Bean and Carly Bad Hartbull. Um, so they, this dynamic trio, I don't, I, people may have heard about this, but they successfully changed the name of Minnesota's largest lake, which is in Minneapolis, um, from Lake Calhoun back to its original Dakota name, which is Bidet Makaska. Uh, so that was a big deal. Um, and we, there was a ceremony to honor them, and it, it was a really great thing for the state and the community. Um, so they were, uh, yeah, it was, it was a big deal. Um, and the return to the Dakota name became official in 2018, so that was great. Um, I also want to thank Amia for, Amia paid to send a group of us there, and we should acknowledge that's a really big deal. Um, the, Amia really put the, their money where their mouth is on this project. They sent a fair amount of money to send a group of us, and you should thank the Amia board for that. Um, we should all thank them. Okay. So uh, the community archiving workshop was re represented by Marie Lasku, Maria Ulinskis, Kelly Hicks, and myself. Uh, Rachel Matson also drove down from Minneapolis to help. Michael Pond was also there from the National Museum of the American Indian, and he helped with organizing. He also led a conversation about challenges of preserving recordings, et cetera. Um, and we had about 35 people from the conference who joined us, and also a couple of walk-ins, and it was a really great day. You can see pictures of us all having fun, doing our thing there. Um, so our community partner uh, for the workshop was the Midway Ganel Mid Library and Tribal Archives of Red Lake Nation. And they were represented at the workshop by two members, two staff members, Jen Hart, who you'll be hearing from later, and also James Cloud, both of Red Lake Nation. So our initial contact with Red Lake came from the library director, Cassie Leeport, and she was part of the planning process, but she gave birth like the week of the conference, so she obviously wasn't there um, for a very good reason. Um, and uh, so the connection with Cassie came from a program at UW-Madison's Information School called TLAM, which is Tribal Li Libraries, Archives, and Museums, which is led by Omar Poehler which is a program, Omar has done a lot of great things in Madison and for the uh, tribal nations in Minnesota and Wisconsin in particular um, to bring students to do work and do uh, internships and service learning experiences in, at various tribal nations. And we've done a lot with AB materials as part of that program. So Cassie uh, was a student of Omar's and then she went on to Red Lake. So we had a really strong connection with her. Um, but I'm going to let Jen tell you more about the Red Lake archives and a little bit about their backstory. So at the, comp at the workshop, we had, like I said, about 35 attendees. We processed just under 200 audiovisual assets. That was film, video, and audio cassettes. Um, and in terms of day of and organizing, all of the CA members had a different role. Um, Marie took the lead on coordinating the pre-workshop calls and she set up the spreadsheet that we were going to use to capture metadata. Um, Kelly put together a really great, more simplified version of our normal technical presentation, which was great. Um, Mar Mariah coordinated with Amia and took the lead with the day of stuff and I uh, drove up with a lot of film inspection equipment, uh, rehousing materials for the film, and a little uh, VHS digitizing station. So it's truly a group effort. Um, and the day was really, really successful. Um, we had a lot of really good feedback from the participants. You can see lots of people having fun, lots of smiles. Um, a lot of people commented that they felt like this was the way 
archival processing should just happen all the time, that you're not just doing it by yourself, but with a group of people, which I totally agree with it. Um, so we felt like it was a really successful workshop, maybe one of the most successful ones we've ever done. Um, it was really reasonably paced. We got everything done, which is maybe the first time we've ever processed everything that was brought. We're always a little too ambitious. Um, and it was really a learning opportunity from both sides. So um, we, got, we got feedback that the people who came to the workshop learned a lot of valuable skills about uh, you know, capturing the right metadata about AV collections, but the CA organizers also learned a lot about the special needs of this community's collections. Um, so it would be great to continue to work with communities outside of EMEA on CAWs um, at other professional organizations. Um, we also got a lot of requests to bring CA to the tribal archives, um, especially because so many of them are not allowed to have their collection materials leave their uh, reservations or archives. So it's really important to have people come to them. Um, so we hope to continue building on these partnerships. Um, so that's all I'm going to say. And I want to bring up Jen um, from Red Lake Nation Tri Tribal Archives to tell you more about her role in the workshop and what she got out of it. So thanks for coming, Jen. Tom was a really fun experience, and um, oh, this was just to show yeah, you where they're located. Yeah, that's way up there. Yeah, we're way up there, and we got we got a lot of snow. <laughs> I just caught I had to call my bank this morning, and and then I talked to somebody, and they were like, yeah, we got more snow. <laughs> uh -huh. So. Um, this was our uh, sacred object storage. Um, the, we started the archives in um, 1989 and um, we had like two different people that were running it and um, this picture here is, it's, it's really sad. It's, I, I don't like seeing this. Um, but the, the guy that was the last one to run the archives um, after he passed away, um, it just kind of turned into a dumping ground. Um, they cut up all funding and everything um, to the library and archives. And um, a lot of people didn't know where to put things, so they just kind of just shoved it in here. And, um, and it's really sad to see. Um, this is kind of afterwards. We kind of took a lot of the um, sacred objects and pulled them out of here. Um, but we had like Ojibwe scrolls and things that should never have been <laughs> in this condition. But yeah, that's um, yeah, that's that. Okay, and then this is um, this is the what we um, three years ago when the library opened. Um, this is what they gave us for our archives, and uh, like right away when we looked at this. Um, we we're thinking this isn't enough space either, <laughs> but it's a lot better than like where we came from. So now, um, when you go into the when you go into the archives um, that we have in the library now, all the um, shelving that's there, there's boxes and everything's in boxes and not just out and about. And our sacred objects are in a separate area than this, and they're on the same kind of shelves, but we have red. Um, red cloth that we have everything laying out on and only tribal members have access to that. Those aren't just open for the public. And then they have to be like a spiritual leader or somebody um, that knows what they're doing. We won't just let just anybody in, in there. Okay. Oh yeah, so this is, this is what we, you know, we went from that messy unorganized room to this and this is this is what we're trying to do now with um, with all of our um, with our collection. Um, we have a lot of really interesting things in the library or in the archives. Um, there's a lot of um, powwow pictures, and um, basketball is a really good like basketball really brings the community together. And um, I'm not sure. Um,
Okay, yeah. Um, so the things that we brought to the okay, um, the things that we brought to um, to Atom um, to our work to the workshop, um, we had cassette tapes, um, VHS, um, we had film reels, and um, like one of the one of the things that we um, that we come across when we were doing the film and we were taking the film off of the old because it was kind of like. I don't know, like pilling and stuff. So we transferred it on to the new reels. And then as we were going through, then we saw like, it's at Dean's birth in uh, 1957. So then we were just like, oh cool, you know? And then, then we all like grabbed our cell phones and we were like trying to look at it with, like, with the flashlights, trying to look at it. And then somebody had a light table, I think it was you. So then we're sitting there and then we were like pulling it along and I'm like, oh my gosh, it's actually showing this guy's birth. So then when, um, after like we left the conference and stuff and then when I got home and then um, I ran into the lady because I was just kind of like um, <coughs> just talking to different people and like who was Dean 1957 like we're in a small community everybody knows everybody there isn't that many Deans around so we kind of kind of figured it out then when I recognized the lady in the in the photo um, and um, I had run into her in the community and then she told me although we told her about the video and stuff and she just kind of shed a tear and she was just like you know my house burnt down 20 years ago and we lost everything and we don't know where a lot of things went they lost pictures and film and everything like that so she was really glad to know that we still have that covers and um we told her like eventually it will be digitized and we will be able to give her a copy of that and she was really appreciative of that <laughs> Thanks, and hi again. Um, so my name is Kelly Hicks, and um, I am uh, an independent archivist, and one of the major projects that I'm working on is with the Nashville, uh, we're calling it the Audiovisual Conservation Center, but it's um, part of the Nashville uh, uh, Metro Archives collection, which is housed um, in the award-winning Nashville Public Library, Library of the Year 2017. Um, so I'm going to give a case study of how cause have played a role in um, really transforming that collection um, and how they've developed over the last couple of years. And first I'll give you just a brief background on what the project is. Um, this, uh, in 2015, um, I started to, I think I was actually working with them a little bit, but I, it came to my attention that there was a collection of film found by um, members of the library in their offsite storage facility. It was about uh, 5,000 um, objects, it was video, film, and audio materials. And um, Mariah, what was the conference that you were coming to town for? It's the National Council for Public History. Okay, the National Council for Public History. Mariah was coming into town and she said we should do a community archiving workshop in Nashville since we're both going to be there. And, and, and we like coordinated with uh, it was a work Ken Feith. We, we actually proposed it to the NCPH as a workshop. Oh, okay. So we ran it as a conference workshop with not only a different organization. Right, yes, that's important to know, yeah. Um, so, uh, so we did a community archiving workshop in 2015 and it was really successful in some ways. It had some, it had some pluses and minuses, um, but this is the room in the archives where we Form the workshop, and these are some of the materials, pneumatic and VHS and film materials. So we processed a, probably a couple of hundred um, uh, items that day, and we brought a lot of people in from the conference and the community, and it was pretty successful. It also, I think its biggest success in my opinion is that it really advocated for the collection and brought attention to the needs of the collection. Um, and then, uh, let's see here. And then I actually left Nashville and we didn't know much about what was going on with the project, but 
uh, because of those advocacy efforts of the CA and some other um, community members and staff of the library, um, a project, which is now the Audiovisual Conservation Center, was actually funded. Um, so I came back to help out with that project, and now I work um, with them about 26 hours a week, so like kind of part-time. Um, so it really helped to set up um, our whole project that we're working on now. Um, and in 2018, uh, this year, we did our second community archiving workshop, just um, independently. Um, and we worked with, we actually did something interesting this time, which was that we worked with a local church who had a DVD collection that they needed um, since uh, ripping. And so we had two organizations working together. So uh, we had a super successful day. We processed uh, about 150 items from our collection. And then we also, um, uh, took care of, like we ripped a lot of DVDs and processed a lot of DVDs from the church um, collection as well. And this was our assistant, who couldn't be here today, Melanie uh, Mentz. Um, so it really helped to have two archivists at this conference, or at this uh, community archiving workshop. Um, so quickly, I just want to go over like the plus and minuses. Um, our first workshop, um, it, it's been interesting because uh, I think follow through is always one of the big challenges that we have with our partnership organizations, but since I was on the community archiving workshop in 2015 and now I actually ended up working in the collection, um, there's really strong follow through there. And what I saw was that some, the collection in the meantime during that gap actually moved from one collection area to another and all the paperwork from the Kenya Archiving Workshop actually kind of disappeared. Um, so that work did have to do, be done over again. Um, so that's just, just in all honesty, like that was one of the drawbacks. But uh, the upside is that um, it just created so much momentum for the collection that that drawback is, is, uh, is tiny. Um, it doesn't really matter in the big scheme of things. Um, so um, yeah, I think that's that's basically all I have to say. It's been great. Um, oh, and importantly, we're now going to be the regional hub for the IMLS funded project, uh, which is uh, the hub for the Southeastern United States. Um, so there will be community archiving workshops happening through Nashville uh, Metro Archives over the next two years. So basically we went from one really small community archiving workshop um, in 2015 to up until uh, 2020, we will be actually serving as a hub. So it's been a really nice example of how one small community archiving workshop had this ripple effect, and um, we hope to just keep growing it through that, um, through this institution and others. So, yeah. All right, thanks. So I'm going to talk about the um, MLS project that everyone keeps referring to, which is really exciting because after um, seven years of purely volunteer efforts on our part, we're actually funded, um, which the members of CA are really bad at accepting. <laughs> we are so behind on building the MLS because none of you guys will turn in hours. They will turn in these tiny hours for all the work we do. It's crazy. But anyhow, so what I'm here to talk about is the uh, Community Archiving Workshop Training of Trainers program, which is funded by MLS and actually sponsored by EMEA as our umbrella sponsor. Um, so I totally just stole all of, the, <laughs> all of Sanders maps because I became totally fascinated and I learned how to make my own Google Maps. Oh no, we don't have presenter notes. I have to wing it. Okay, we're all friends here, right? It'll be okay. <laughs> So I wanted to actually go back and start with uh, the maps that Sandra showed earlier to sort of talk about the spread of the contact that CA is making and trying to make. This map represents <coughs> where we've had CAUSE, and I'm only really talking about the continental United States right now, uh, because IMLS obviously is uh, federal funding, and um, we've only done stuff in the continental so far, but so this is where we've had cause so far, and it's always aligned with the EMEA conference. Um, you know, we've been doing it as a pre-conference workshop for years. 
now the new AV Fair is like a slightly different format, but we've been pretty tied to doing it with Amina. And I think when Kelly and I did the workshop with NCPH um, in Nashville, it was a little scary because unlike Amina, we were the only audiovisual archivists at that workshop and everybody else was a historian. And I was like, oh, I don't know, but we got through it. So, you know, a testament for the fact that this doesn't always be tied to Amina. And then back to the map about where the call members live. So we have a very like mostly coastal situation happening in terms of um, where where CA and the effect it's trying to have can possibly reach. And so we approach the IMLS making this assumption, and I know it's a very broad assumption, but you know, essentially what we said is the lion's share of expertise around audiovisual preservation is very coastal. It's really um, supported in New York City by NYU's MIAP program, and in LA by UCLA's MIAS, is that how you're supposed to say that? Um, <laughs> MIAS <laughs> program in the entertainment industry. You know, additionally, obviously, there are a lot of universities, both, both public and private, as well as museums, that have really great audiovisual preservation efforts underway. But those are incredibly focused on the collections of those institutions. And what the Community Archiving Workshop really wants to be about is how to support collections that live outside of those institutions so that they can stay within the communities from which they were produced and also like, be described by those communities, utilized by those communities, and for those communities to really retain um, ownership and control over their collections. So what we did was we went to the IMLS with a proposal that we would take the workshop we had developed in conjunction with EMEA and take it to libraries, community-based organizations, and independent media makers. Um, why libraries? Our argument is that libraries often serve as the archives of and for the communities that they serve, that many libraries find themselves struggling to manage these unique and aging media collections, which they get, and also that these collections content vital to the history and culture of those specific communities. Why community organizations? We argued that there are important regional collections that exist within community, cultural, and faith-based organizations. And obviously, these organizations are under resource. They also contain really uh, unique material, which if lost, cannot be recovered. And often, the only opportunity for preservation comes when these organizations uh, allow their collections to be acquired by a large institution, often taking the collection out of its community. I did do a slide for why independent media makers, but you know, you get it, right? Um, and so, you know, if you haven't already gotten the sense, the Community Archiving Workshop, we're very much a collective, things happen very organically. So the way the IMLS project happened was Pamela Vatican saw a posting about this funding opportunity, and she was like, hey, Ka should do this. And it was like, who wants to do this? Who's going to work on the grant? Like a lot of people worked on the grant proposal. We are like the queens and king, Jeff Martin, of Google Docs. <laughs> we do everything in Google Docs. So we have like a good probably two month period where we are all writing these grant proposals together. And three COM members volunteered to be what we refer to as the anchor sites for the IMLS project. So Pamela Vatican, who's based out of San Francisco, Kelly Hicks in Nashville, Tennessee, and Amy Slipper in Madison, Wisconsin. And so those are our anchor sites for this particular project. April 18th, we found out we got the grant. Super exciting. Um, and so this is basically what it is. The training of trainers is actually supposed, we proposed it as an 18 month project, but it's already clearly spreading into two years, which is fine. Uh, but between the spring of 2019 and the end of the summer of 2020, we're going to do 12 workshops. What that is is three what we call the training of trainers workshops, which is where we teach people how to run their own cause, and then nine community archiving workshops. So in each region there will be one workshop where we train people on how to run their own workshop, and then within that region they will organize three more of their own cause. There are three national regions being served, uh, which we made an argument are fairly underserved regions, which are the Midwest, the Southeast, and Northern California. Of course, there are lots of even more underserved regions, and we're going to get there. We're going to draw anchor states there eventually, but it hasn't happened yet. 
So the anchors um, are all library serving organizations in uh, California. It's an organization called California Revealed, which is now based out of Sacramento, Recollection, Wisconsin, and Madison, Madison, Wisconsin, and the Nashville Metro Archives, which Kelly spoke about. And the role of the anchors is to be the site where people get trained on how to run workshops. They also play a critical role in identifying who the community partners are, and that is people who not only participate in workshops, but will potentially host one of the subsequent workshops that follow in that region. Um, we also are gonna take the cock kit, the film kit that Amy Slipper designed, um, that EMEA has one of, and we're gonna have one in each region that can be checked out. It will live at the anchor site and get, can get checked out by people in the community if they start doing their own cause. We also designed um, a really simple digitization kit. The purpose of the digitization kit is not to be a workhorse and do a lot of digitization. It's really to demystify for people the process of digitization. So at each workshop, there will be a digitization kit set up where people can see a basic like VHS digitization happen, something like that. Um, each organization gets a sub-award. We believe firmly in paying people for their participation in all of these activities. Uh, and there's also a digitization incentive. So we have a lot of a certain amount of money from the grant for people once they do the CA and they have their spreadsheet and they have their inventory to highlight a couple of uh, pieces that they think it would be helpful for their community to have preserved and make visible so people can actually see what the end result of doing the sort of preservation work is. Um, and so that's you know a fund so people can send stuff out for digitization. So using um, the, the Midwest region, wait, is that right? <laughs> yeah, Amy's region, <laughs> um, I'm not a geographer. Uh, as an example, just to show how we're imagining, uh, what this is really all about is for Ka to find out how we can scale and help people replicate what we've been doing. We've tried, like, Sandra has been so dedicated for years to putting up every piece of documentation that we've ever produced on this website and we're really not sure if people are using it or getting into it. So this is really all about like how do we spread the tools and the skills and the documentation that we've developed by doing this volunteer, volunteer workshop for seven years so that other people can harness these tools and these skills and do them themselves. So here is um, what our Midwest region looks like. And so Recollection Wisconsin and Madison is the hub and that's where the top will take place. And then the community partners that have been identified are the Milwaukee Public Museum, the Chippewa Valley Museum, and the Neville Public Museum. And so each one of those organizations will have staff that participate in the training of trainers. We will support them, but they will go back to their own communities and they will organize, organize a call themselves where they will have an opportunity to invite people from nonprofit organizations, faith-based organizations, independent media makers to come participate in their PA and learn all of these skills as well. Um, and the, there is a stipend and digitization incentive for these institutions as well. And so this is kind of like, a link. I, I'm trying to like figure out how to express this with um, Google Slides graphics. <laughs> you know, it's like this idea of like, how can we spread these skills and these tools and this knowledge and so that's kind of what we imagine like that region starts to look like. And then so here's like, with this one ground, right? We have this one ground that we're doing these three regions. I mean, we are, you know, headed for like total domination later. But right now, this is what we've got. And we would love to continue, if this is a successful uh, project, to go back to IMLS again and be like, now we want to hit the middle of the country and we want to go to Puerto Rico and we want to go to all these different places. But this is where we're at right now. So this is what we're doing in the next two years. Um, just so you understand, like, how this scales in terms of numbers. The annual workshop that we do with EMEA serves one geographic region, serves between one and three organizations or collections, trains roughly 20 community volunteers who come to the one-day workshop, and we always shoot for processing about 200 audiovisual assets in the workshop. Uh, with the IMLS funding over a two-year period, we're gonna serve three geographic regions, uh, 12 organizations and collections, train roughly 200 community volunteers, and process roughly 2,400 audiovisual assets, if the numbers sort of match the way Ka has always worked. 
we'll also be establishing these common digitization kits in each region and leaving them there. And I think the sort of obvious like safety to this project is that we have COM members who are located in these regions so they can always provide the, the support um, needed for people as they like, try and get off the ground or if they come to check out the kit and they've forgotten how to use certain things in it. But really, like ideally, what we would love to see in the long term is more EMEA members becoming sort of those anchor people throughout the country. COD doesn't have to stay the same 11 people. How many are we? <laughs> that we have been for seven years. People can totally join us. We would love that. So, um, and I just love this picture. Uh, workshop I unfortunately missed that was in Savannah, Georgia with an organization that's really dear to me, a youth media organization. Um, but I wanted to end on this slide and just end but on a couple of things that I think are really important to point out about the community archiving workshop. One is that we strive to not be a didactic model. We're not trying to arrive in regions and tell everybody like what they need to do and how to do it. It has to be super flexible and that's the thing that we've already learned with the IMLS grant because to put forward the, pro the proposal of IMLS, we had to give them a very cookie cutter model of like, we will do this exact same thing in these three regions, but that's totally not how it's gonna happen because these are three distinctly different cultural regions. And so the, the cop person in each one of those regions is really responsible for tailoring the project in a way that it best meets the needs of that community, best utilizes the resources and networks already in place in that community. And really the focus like community and community archiving workshop is actually really the focus. Like our goal, it's not like we don't believe that libraries should be acquiring collections, but our goal is for communities to understand the collections which they have produced, the value of them, what it requires to preserve and maintain them, and to understand like what kind of choices they can make in terms of how to care for their collections, how to preserve them, how to create access around them, and potentially how to keep them where they might belong best. Um, and the partnership with the communities to do the workshop is incredible because these are the people that provide all of the context and the processing. I don't know, I've done the community archiving workshop so much now that I almost don't understand how people process collections if you don't have the people who understand what the collection it is with you. I love one of my favorite examples is always when we did the workshop in Richmond five years ago. Um, we processed a collection of audiovisual, their oral histories um, from communities that don't exist anymore because they were pushed out by the development of a freeway in Richmond. And there are a bunch of elders it was a lot of elderly people who came to volunteer for the workshop, and they could pick up every single tape and describe exactly what it was and what it meant that this recording existed, and that you can have that kind of contextualization in the description of a collection, even if someday that collection is going to go on to a traditional university library or something like that, to have that moment of processing happen with people who can best describe the context of the collection is so incredibly important. So, yeah, that's it. Did I get everything I should have? And I should point out, I didn't really put up any slides about the curriculum, which is a huge part of what this project is, uh, because we haven't done it yet. <laughs> but, uh, we are, you know, um, aside of the, the documentation we've created about how to actually do the workshop, which is really a lot of the technical, like what do you look for when you're inspecting a videotape versus when you're inspecting an audio reel, things like that. Um, we are producing uh, curricular modules about how do you approach a community, how do you do outreach, uh, how does communications work, how do you pick a location for a workshop, what kinds of supplies do you need, and so, uh, Mona Jimenez, Marie Lasku, and Jeff Martin are sort of leading while Amy and Kelly and Pamela are sort of organizing the regional TOTS, Training of Trainers Workshops. Uh, Marie and Mona and Jeff are really leading with developing what will be a menu of curricular modules so that people can come in and be like, okay, well, I only have a video collection and this is sort of the level of expertise in this community. And so they can pick bits of the curriculum and piece it together, like almost label it together into something that meets their needs. 
Uh, so that's going to be a huge part of it, and it's going to be on um, what we're calling the toolkit. <laughs> Our high school website. <laughs> Sandra's in charge of it. <laughs> but um, yeah, so that's going to be a huge outcome from this project. That's it. Okay, so we have time for questions. Uh, and one thing I want to point out, I forgot to mention that in the film kit, Amia gave us funding to pull that together. And that was like, that was amazing. <laughs> we have such great support from Amia, and it's been helpful over the years. Thank you guys. I, I love this project. I'm so happy to finally hear the details of the IMLS grant because I've been excited about it and hearing about it, but I actually didn't know what was happening. Mariah, while you were talking, I started wondering, um, because now I work in a collection that's expressly a queer archival collection, and I started thinking about how the regional archives model is so incredibly useful, but it actually maybe doesn't work for some kinds of collections, and I was wondering if in the future you thought there was the possibility that it it would be effective or possible, just theoretically, I obviously know you don't have funding for anything beyond what you're doing now, um, but if you thought that the regional is, is the only way to organize this kind of thing, or if you thought that maybe there was a way to do a more a community-based model that was about a non-regional kind of community, and if you can talk about how that, what problems that might, challenges that might raise, or opportunities, or whether you thought about that at all, or if the regional thing is really the core way that you think this could work, or any of you can talk about it, but uh, Mariah's talk, or your presentation was the one that made me think about I can say one thing about that. Um, and I love the idea of organizing workshops uh, strategically around specific communities, and I think, like non-regional communities, and I think, one obvious example of that is that because of the success of our workshop with Atom, which was a workshop of uh, tribal archivists that are very much dispersed, and one of the things that really came up in the workshop, and I know I've said this to a bunch of you, and it's probably getting boring to hear me say it over and over again, but is that if you are an archivist and you work alone in an archive and you feel alienated, you should try being a tribal archivist. Um, the people who participated in the workshop at ATOM were so excited to be together. Like, they really were like, this is how we should do this. We should spend more time together. We should take turns processing each other's archives. And we actually are going to pursue some funding. Uh, we, we were sort we of We wanted to tapped. bring you guys home with us. Yeah, yeah, everyone wanted us to come home with them, and we wanted to go home with everybody. Uh, but I think that's a good example. It's, it's not regional, it's cultural and, and community-based in a different way. Um, and I think we are going to pursue to try and get funding to take costs specifically to tribal archives um, and bring more tribal archivists together. And so if we're talking about queer archives and queer archivists, like, well, why wouldn't we do it that way if we're talking? You know, like, the that workshop in Savannah, like, approaching archiving, like, youth media organizations, can be so totally different than working with like a historical society or something. So yeah, love, would love to. Does anybody else want to add to that? Yeah, and I think like um, leveraging like the power of conferences has been really helpful because you know it's just a natural place where people come together. So always let us know if there's some place where we can um, use a conference as a way to like bring people together um, in that in that way that's not like a geographic that we should have an interest or or what have you. Any other questions? And I saw this. So the question is <laughs> So the question is at the at these uh, workshops, are you also doing metadata, or are you using the existing metadata? How do you deal with that? I mean, you have actual material, but what's on the material? Do you know? In, are you talking about uh, in like an inventory process, or in like embedding that into a file? In metadata, like who is it, where is it, what is it? Oh, that's a huge part of uh -huh. why we do it as a community collaboration. Should I talk into that? Um, so, so our process has always been 
to work with the organization whose collection we're going to process for the workshop well in advance and we find out how do they already organize their metadata do they have spreadsheets do they use filemaker like we just work with whatever systems they have and maybe someone else can speak more about it because that's where I always back away. I'm like, I don't want to deal with that. Um, when we worked with you guys at ATOM, Marie worked with you guys in advance to understand how do you organize your metadata, we try as much as we can to uh, adopt the language of the organization whose collection is being processed and we pre-set up spreadsheets or sometimes there have been instances where we've maybe done an analog. Can you pull up the Google Sheet and show them what we did? Maybe. Maybe. Yeah. Well, we're, in there? we're also doing examples of that at the AV Fair on Saturday. So you can actually see the types of inventory spreadsheets we use, and then uh, theoretically that information can just be... And you're um, creating those sheets as you're ingesting... Yeah, or we, we, get, we get the doing? spreadsheet set up in advance. Uh -huh. We do a lot of work in advance to adopt the language of the organization whose collection we're processing. We fix as many of the fields as possible because remember we've got a bunch of community volunteers coming in and doing data entry. And so we do as many, we essentially create spreadsheets with as many drop down menus as possible to describe everything we think might possibly come up. And like at ATOM, we probably had what, 10, 12 laptops out that people were putting metadata into, and we had to teach them how to do it at the spot, but like I said, as many drop-down menus as humanly possible to reduce error, and by the end of the day, Marie had collected them all on a thumb drive and consolidated them into one spreadsheet, and she's amazing, gone through and spell-checked and fixed everything, and we're able to send them home yeah, like six, with a full inventory. Like six months worth of work is, we did that in, yeah, it was like six months worth of work and we did that in like eight hours. Mm -hmm. With a big lunch break. With a big lunch break. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it was like six hours. <laughs> Our long lunch break. Oh, well, then, yeah. Yeah, it wasn't even full six hours of processing because we did presentations and stuff, so. Yeah. I mean, some, some, you know, there was one cluster of sort of slightly older ladies that seemed a little bit resistant to the whole. <laughs> they were like, I think their spreadsheet had like five entries on it by the end of the day, but that was great. You know, we just added it to everything else. So, yeah. So this is this is the spreadsheet from Red Lake Nation that we produced. And then the participants who come with from other collections can use this same spreadsheet. So they have basically a, a set of fields that they can use to do the same type of inventories on their own collections, which I think is something people get stuck on is just like knowing where to even start. So people always ask us for a copy of this or and we share it. So that's another way it spreads across the country. We've also worked on, as Mariah mentioned, an analog version to where we just have handouts and people just fill them in. And then another section of uh, the workshop can actually enter them in using a Google form or a spreadsheet. And the reason we did the flash drives, we did the flash drives because the internet was sketchy. It's mm -hmm. <laughs> like we were all gonna do go on Google Sheets and just do it all at once, but we end up doing them in sections. <coughs> Any other questions? We have about seven minutes. That's the room. Any other process questions? What happened? Any conferences that people can think of that we could, you know, land ourselves in and take our little car bubble <laughs> of production? <laughs> car factory. Yeah. <laughs> we should have a bus. We should have a bus. <laughs> I'm dreaming of it. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. Well, thank you very much for coming. <laughs>